Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. I'm excited to have Peter Doyle joining me today. Hi Peter. Hi Jackie. So Peter is a novelist and non-fiction writer. He has created major exhibitions on pulp publishing and forensic material cultures. His books include City of Shadows and Crooks Like Us and the novel The Big Whatever. He is a recipient, a recipient of two Ned Kelly Awards for his fiction, as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award. He is an Honorary Associate Professor at media, of Media at Macquarie University in Sydney. And Suburban Noir is his latest book. I've got my copy here. Um, just want to say to people watching as well that thanks to New South Publishing, if you ask a question of Peter, you'll have a chance to win your own copy of Suburban Noir. And um, all you need to do for that is type in comments your question and I can read it out. So thanks, Peter, for joining us. Just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about Suburban Noir. Yes, Jackie, sure. Well, it's a, it's a non-fiction book and it um, it feels like it's taken me half my adult life to write it, but I'm sure that's not actually the case. Uh, but it grew out of some uh, work I was doing back in the earlier 2000s um, with a big, you know, a big, uh, a huge collection of old forensic photos that's <clears throat> held here in Sydney. Yeah. Um, just negatives, a lot of them are unidentified and they're not, they're quite mysterious and there's 140,000 of them. So it's kind of a monster. And um, I've spent, you know, a, a lot of time just looking through those uh, as a guest curator at the museum that holds them. And I also, uh, you know, I was looking at a lot of photos from the 1950s and 60s, where most of the photos in that collection date from. And during that time, I was um, I was made aware of my late uncle's um, also pretty random, chaotic collection of papers and photos mm. and documents and stuff. So um, yeah, it's, it was a particular problem trying to write a book or do an exhibition. There was an exhibition years ago when you've got, you know, having too little material is one problem, but having a lot of material yeah. is another problem. So anyway, eventually I wrangled it into something and that's the book. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I really, really enjoyed it. All the diff there were some really weird and strange things that happened. And I went to a writer's festival and they said that usually um, the truth is stranger than fiction. Is that what you found? Yeah, yeah. It, well, it is actually, um, Jackie. And, and in in funny ways, sometimes, um, in I mean, it, it's gloomier than fiction. Mm. Well, even gloomy, there's some. There, there is a, a mood of real life crime and accidents and the things people do. Uh, you know, a little bit of it in fiction, you know, like you, 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 you read a mystery or, uh, you know, even a, you know, a really grim thriller, perhaps a fiction, you know, about serial killers or something. It's housed in a, in a readable story, but in real life crime and the real things that happen to people and the court proceedings and the photographs is really grim yeah you know, it's really depressing even when it's when no one dies it's grim often it's more often not terribly romantic not performed by um you know glamorous people but often mm -hmm. people who aren't terribly uh lucky in life mm -hmm. either with you know um background or intellect or outlook or anything so yeah it's um it's, it's gloomy, yeah. so stranger than fiction in that way. But sometimes just weirder too, just the thinking that goes behind some of the robberies. Um, but there's one robbery in there that I talked about where in the 1960s, a kid in Western Sydney, I mean, a kid, he was a young apprentice, 19 years old, not, mm. a, not a child of, mm. at law, somehow uh, saw a movie in which somebody had won, uh, somebody had... Um, stolen all the tickets to the Irish sweepstakes and won it. And this guy oh. thought somehow 
that he could win the Opera House Lottery, which was worth £100,000, a huge amount of money at the time, mm. unbelievable amount of money, um, by, by, by somehow stealing, robbing a petrol station and stealing enough money to buy enough ticket. You know, it was some weird thing, but somebody ended up dying mm. in that. You know, they, mm. he rode in on the back of his friend's motorbike with a sawn off 22, and instead of getting, you know, he got a pittance from the set from the till but killed the young man who was working you know anyway mm -hmm. it's a kind of it's a mad story because you go what was the guy thinking but somebody died as a result and that's yeah. often the tenor of crime you you encounter mm -hmm. and you mentioned your uncle did you ever meet your uncle yeah yeah no i i um, met him plenty but uh, we never spoke about his work particularly you um, don't. Mm. he died he died in the early 2000s mm. and he'd been retired for many years then um yeah i mean i sort of wish i wish i had a little bit he was very articulate mm. and like a lot of retired police men and women um and retired lawyers for that matter and judges they often like to talk about their professional life yeah you know? and, uh, and I think my uncle Brian was definitely one of those people. He had plenty of stories and he could tell a story. Well, I can see that just from the bits and pieces he wrote mm. himself. And he could write a report, an internal report, very eloquently, you know. And, um, and and you can feel the enjoyment of him telling the stories, which a lot of coppers seem to have. They enjoy a story. Yeah, like yeah. That. And we've got a few people watching, so just wanted to remind the people watching, if you do have a question for Peter, please type it in comments and I can read it out and you'll have a chance to win a copy of his book. Um, Kelly says, what true crime shocked you the most? Well, um, a lot of, uh, well, <laughs> that's a surprisingly <laughs> tricky question, actually. <laughs> um, the, probably, probably the most famous uh, true crime case that I touch in the book where my uncle Brian Doyle uh, later in the case played a pivotal role. He brought back the perpetrator from uh, extradited him back from uh, Colombo in um, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, mm. brought him back to Australia. Now that in that uh, an 11 year old boy at the time I was 11 actually um, oh sorry have I got that wrong and uh, uh, 10 or 11 years old I've actually forgotten now uh, was kidnapped and his parents had won the lottery. Uh, it was Graham Thorne. He was kidnapped for ransom, but the kidnapper was such a bungler. The boy died on day one mm. in mysterious, not actually explicitly murdered by the kidnapper, but he was so he was treated in such an offhand way that the, mm. the, the boy died. That is pretty horrible. Yeah. Um, and in fact, walking working through the police records. Um, it's one, you know, some crimes are overrepresented and crimes against children um, sometimes are the most, you know, the most uh, publicised at the time. But I have, you know, I've got two in the book and they're both really horrible and mm. that was about enough out of about 70 or 80 crimes. So yeah. that's, yeah, yeah, pretty ghastly. Yeah. And was there a lot that you found that you weren't able to put in the book? um well yeah as i say you've got to balance it out i mean back to your question you know real uh, earlier on about stranger than fiction mm. well it's sort of bleaker than fiction too mm. and one thing that is really overrepresented in police records but not in the stories we tell for our entertainment about crime what's overrepresented is is suicide mm. and those days the 1950s and 60s i mean i guess suicide's always a very um, melancholy business mm. for the people, you know, the people who remain. And the suicides back then, um, when you find the story or find the coroner's, um, you know, the inquest, the transcripts of the inquest and so on, they're, um, they can be very poignant. But, you know, the, a book that you want to sell, you can only put so many suicides. Yeah. In. yeah. It's a downer for everyone and it's not mm. right to kind of, overburden the reader with this grim stuff but uh yeah so uh if i was 
if I was being representative of crime, said half the book would be taken over with motor accidents. Yeah, you know, I lots saw of people it. Yeah. died. People died in cars in those days, and the police, about fifty percent of police work then seems to have been going to road fatalities. Mm. I mean, twenty times the rate that we have now, mm. and um, and suicide. So you have to kind of tweak it a little bit. Mm. I was very interested. In what was overrepresented were cases where abused young women. Uh, married women finally turned on their abuser, their violent abuser, <laughs> picked up a bread knife and put it between his shoulder blades, you know, after he sort of um, assaulted, mm. in both cases, assaulted the wife, young wives with babies. And every time I'm, well, I was writing that, every time I told people, you know, because you get taken up with the story yeah, you're writing yeah. about, reading about, I went, oh, yeah, this woman, she lived in the house <laughs> down the road there. You know, the guy came home drunk and hit her with an empty beer bottle at two in the morning and, you know, she picked up the knife and stabbed him. Everyone, women, every woman I told that story to immediately said, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in that case, the court actually went, you know what, fair, fair enough. And yeah. uh, in a couple of those cases, the women got uh, more or less released. The, the jail time they did while they were pending, pending their, their trial. Uh, in both cases, the courts went, yeah, you've done enough. Mm. Go out and find the kids. Yeah. <laughs> Which <on> probably <laughs> is a little bit surprising at that time because in those times, probably like domestic violence and that wasn't as much acknowledged, was it? Yeah, no, that's exactly right, Jackie. That was my um, reaction too. I was surprised mm. that, I mean, the courts then could be so biased, uh, mm. so biased against women so biased against women whose morals, you know, in the terms of the day were called into question, mm. stuff that nobody would blink at even now, but back then. So a lot of the times the courts, you know, <laughs> it doesn't read well, but sometimes they got it right. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. quite quite good to see. Yeah, yeah. and opinion. the one thing that um, I remember as well that I found interesting was like the poisoning, I think was it rat poisoning and that I'd, I'd read um a book i can't remember who it was by but it called the husband poisoner but i think yeah. in your book you've got like a child who was poisoning her parents yes well that was the tail end of the extremely mm. weird poisoning epidemic mm. basically in sydney in the early 1950s now i was alive i was a baby in the early 1950s mm. But I grew up and I'd never heard of this until I started researching it. And you look back at the newspapers of the time and at the peak of the epidemic, you could pick up an afternoon newspaper, the Daily Mirror or the Sun, and you might, there might be five poisoning, separate poisoning stories in every, oh, really? in every edition wow. of the paper at one point. Mm. And a lot of people died. The mm. poison back then was the rat poison, thallium, but... Um, uh, the one I've got in the book, uh, I think by that time, thallium, finally they restricted it. It was a heavy metal. It could sort of operate without people really knowing they were being poisoned. But the uh, the kid in the book who poisoned the family used uh, weed killer, arsenic, I mm. think it was. Uh, yeah. She took it herself, you know, mm. like, and that, that's, I know that's the case with a lot of the poisonings back then. And there were hundreds of these, mm. hundreds and hundreds. And they've been going on for quite a few years. But in many cases, uh, the poisoner it kind of, you know, once something happened and it came to light, they were a bit shocked that they'd even done it. And they often said things like, oh, well, you know, I just meant to teach them a lesson. Yeah. I didn't mean to really <laughs> hurt them. Just mm -hmm. a bit of hurry up, you know. And in many of those cases were uh, abuse victims too, um, uh, gave their violent husband a nice cup of tea with a bit of, colourless, odourless rat poison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird moment in um, in uh, Australian history and quite quite forgotten until that book that you mentioned came out. Yeah, yeah. And Sharon wonders what you like to read yourself and if you've got any recommendations for us. I recommend, i tell you what I've just finished and it's not brand new, but Annie Prue, um, uh, I think it's, it's one of the Wyoming stories, a bunch of short stories. Uh, it's, uh, I can't remember the title, but Wyoming Stories, Volume 3, just absolutely floored me. And okay. it stayed with me. Some of it's kind of funny and Western stories, yeah. uh, but some of it's so, wow, mm. powerful. Um, <laughs> that was really great. 
I'm actually reading, uh, I'm reading this thing now called uh, Golden Hill. Okay, there it is. Okay. Right yeah, I haven't right. heard of um, them. Yeah. Is that reversed? Yeah, no, no, it's the right way. Um, yeah. yeah. I, um, Francis Spufford, S-P-U-F-F-O-R-D, Golden Hill. It's wonderful historical novel. I, I read, I read all sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I haven't read a lot of crime novels recently, even though I used to read nothing but crime, but I've gone a bit cold on crime novels mm. just recently. Mm. And what are you working on at the moment? I'm working on uh, on a thing which will come out as a novel, and um, but uh, and I'm talking to people who, who have had run-ins with law, mm. either as in their misspent youth, okay. sort of robbing or mm. doing things illegal, and I'm lightly fictionalising it to um, to conceal their identities. Oh, okay. But you know, if, sounds you know, interesting. I play music in pubs, and I've lived in Sydney all my life, mm. and I know pub people, and I know people, and so many of the people I know <laughs> over the years have said, "Ah, oh, tell you what happened <laughs> to me when I got busted," or when you know. You know, I used to rob, you know, I used to steal cars and things like that. When yeah, it's pretty interesting. So yeah. collecting a whole bunch of those stories and putting it together. Uh, I don't know. The working title for that in my, just in my head is I Fought the Law. Okay. The law yeah. One, so <laughs> I Fought the Law. Yeah. No, that That's sounds like it would be an interesting read. And I'm certain, yeah, like especially for you interviewing people and researching that sort of thing, you must be finding some good stories. It's interesting. It's interesting, Jackie, and I do like talking to people, and I like hearing people uh, reflect back on their own. You know, because mm. most people commit crime in their younger days, mm. in their adolescence, or young adulthood, and um, m most of the people I'm talking to, uh, for them, it's it's a fair bit behind them, and they have other lives now, or mm. kids, or responsible mm. jobs and things. In most cases, so. Yeah, it's it's interesting to talk to them and, yeah. and, and see the old the old uh, enthusiasm for crime come yeah. back. They're talking about it. Yeah. And what about when um, *Suburban Noir* was published? Have you had any families, maybe, or friends that were involved in any of those crimes contact you? Yeah, I have actually. Mm. I, I have, and. Um, uh, it's a bit hard to talk about, but one of the main crimes I talked about in the book where what became of the people was mysterious. Mm. Uh, the person I've known slightly for decades, friends of friends approached me and said, person X who you wonder about in the book uh, got out of jail and married my mother. Oh, and, really? <laughs> and, uh, it spun me out so much. Yeah. The person said yes, mm. and he lived a respectable life and died much lamented. And he was one of the one of the villains. In oh, the really? Wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, so that was pretty interesting. And a few people have emailed me with um, bits of, you know, probably too detailed to go into here, but mm. surprising. You know, people know things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it comes out. Yeah. And um, Kim wonders if writing about all this crime, if the, it affects you in any way. Um, it, it can, yeah. No, no, it can get, as I was saying earlier on, it can get terribly gloomy. Mm. Just the sort of, um, oh, the silliness, really, more than anything, of human behaviour and people just lose it and pick up a weapon and, kill somebody and mm. later on or uh yeah so it it, it it it's hard to find the uh sometimes you've got to work hard to find a bit of light in it and i do try to i don't want to just have a gloom fest yeah. or just wallow in how miserable everything is i, I try to keep it upbeat and sort of mm. optimistic in some mm. way because that's how i am about mm. things um but yeah it's uh you know you're seeing the kind of shabbiest worst and and in some cases explicitly evil, but in a lot of cases, I don't know, people people end up not even sure why they did what they did. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Is there anything that you do like to take you away, if you're in the middle of writing something like this, that you might do to like take you away for a while from us or? And yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, the writing I find it's more or less like once I'm 
doing the writing, you know, mm. tapping away at the keyboard or editing and moving it around. But it's just like making a chalk shed or, you know, painting a wall or cooking a meal. Like mm. you're involved in the process of making the thing, the work. Mm. Um, it's more in the research side that I have to kind of keep taking breaks from it. And I know there that, you know, if you go to an archive or out to, you know, the state records or a library, you want to make the most of it. So you you allocate quite a few hours, I do, to be there. Mm. But that makes it really hard and uh, just come away going, oh, my God. Yeah. And, mm. and also certain that I haven't found anything that's tellable or could be possibly of interest to anybody. But then sometimes I find if I talk to another writing friend the next day and he or she, you know, because I communicate with other people working on things, go, well, how'd you go yesterday? And I go, oh, there was this really weird story and I find suddenly there is something to tell, you know, and it might be the, 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 the story I found while I was going through the pages looking for my story mm. and you find another one and, you know, oh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So... Yeah, but, you know, uh, an early night, a good meal and a good sleep, that's the only thing I can do to really yeah, uh, yeah. get out of it. But sometimes you can even dream about the stuff mm, too. And, yeah, so, I can imagine, yeah. yeah. Mm. And do you have a favourite place to write? Are you always writing in the same place? Uh, yeah, I do. I just got a desk in a little room here. That's where mm. I'm sitting now. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I've got a laptop, but I tend not, you know, I tend to sit down at a, yeah, I don't care where I am, really. I like being at home. Um, I'm also very restless. I mean, just for the actual process of writing itself. I know people, you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago when I sort of started writing, um, I was writing a PhD, actually. I could write sometimes two or three, even 3,000 words a day of re quite reasonable writing, mm. um, most of which I ended up keeping. Um, but now I find I'm kind of too restless for that. And, you know, if I write a few sentences, I find I'm up and making a cup of tea and having a walk around and going up the shop and coming mm. back in another 20 minutes and then out to the garden and weed a little bit and then another 20 minutes and something else, making phone calls. So I don't have uh, persistence anymore, but I'm, or I'm easily distracted or I'm, you know, looking at Twitter or something. Mm. But I think that's okay. It's okay to be distracted. I just bounce out and then bounce back and then yeah. <laughs> half an hour away. So if, over the course of a whole day, I can get a bit done. Mm. That's what I find. The only way I can work in 2023 is yeah. to go with the distractedness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you find, are you someone who watches a lot of true crime on TV? No. You don't? I don't watch any, uh, I don't watch any, Jackie. Yeah. I, I've got an aversion to it. I used to a mm. podcast. I liked when the true crime podcast mm. started and I read plenty of true crime books, but I've gone off. Yeah. I'm just finding as you do, you know, there's so much digital content comes yeah. to us. You know, at the moment I'm listening to audio books in the time. I spend a lot of time driving, you know, and uh, I drive interstate to visit family and things mm. and, so audio books, non-fiction and fiction are really winning me over at the moment. I was big on podcasts, but I haven't listened to a podcast for a couple of years. Okay. And I yeah. haven't watched any of the true crime docos on Netflix, or even yeah. the ones I know are, are very good. And, yeah. you know, my daughter watches them and tells me, this one's <laughs> great, you'll love it. And I still haven't got round to them. So maybe I'll just swing back onto that that um you know that 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 work yeah, <laughs> but yeah. at the moment i'm not there yeah and what about as a child growing up were you a big reader and if you were what sort of things were you reading then uh, i read i read comics mm. for a long time mm. <laughs> almost nothing but comics <laughs> and um and yeah my uh a uh, stepmother came into my life when I was about 12 or 13 and um, she had books and she had thousands of books and uh, she was a big reader and my mother had died a few years before and uh, my stepmother kind of went, oh yeah, you like books, well, mm. yeah, you might like this and she get, started giving me a mystery novel, oh, just okay. paperbacks, Agatha yeah. Christie and so on, you know, mm. when I was about 12 and, I, and this is amazing and so I became a big reader and a big reader of crime and whodunits back then. And uh, yeah, my stepmother kept feeding me mm. classics for quite a few years, actually. Mm.
Yeah, mm. that sounds great. And um, Kim says, have you ever wanted to write a fictional story based on your research? Um, you know, the fiction I do write uh, is researched. Uh, but the research I... Yeah, the research I've used in my fiction, this might not quite be the answer to the question he asked, but the, but I do research a lot because my fiction is all set in the past, in 1950s, 60s oh, okay. or 70s like, yeah. Australia. So I sit down and I read newspapers and magazines mm. and music bags and really immerse myself in it. But maybe what he's asking is, um, you know, the facts of a crime turned into fiction. That is kind of what I want to do with this with this project yeah here, with the one you're about a moment ago moment. is, is yeah. use real life experiences and conceal it enough to protect the uh, you know yeah the mm. well mm. thanks so much for chatting with me it's been great talking to you and thanks for the people who joined in and asked some questions thank you jackie and thanks to the people who uh, who have been with us virtually mm. thanks bye everyone okay